Welcome to Beer and Politics. We are your unabashedly sexy hosts. He's Twisted Steel. I'm Sex Appeal. Today we have a cocktail hour special. That's a mixed bag of goodies for you. We're going to talk about whatever we like. Two of the topics we're going to start with today are false equivalency and slippery slopes. I just want to remind you, check us out on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Google Play. Follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, and of course, YouTube. Now, before we get started, we do have a beer review. Madam Brewmaster, what do we have on tap today? Today we are drinking white ale from St. Archer Brewing. St. Archer Brewing, San Diego, California. This is their white ale. Clocks in at around 5% alcohol. Now a white ale is going to be a predominantly wheat beer originating in Belgium. But this, of course, is an American brewery. It's going to have some great tones to it. It'll be an unfiltered beer. So as you can see, it's going to be really cloudy. Uh, there won't be a ton ahead, but it should have a decent level of carbonation. It should be crisp, refreshing, the kind of beer that you would want to drink on a summer's day. And because of the yeast and the wheat malt, because of the yeast? wheat and the yeah, there we go, the yeast and the wheat malt, mm -hmm. it will produce some interesting flavors. All right, so um, it tastes like a white ale to me. I feel like it's a little bit flat on notes. Mm -hmm. uh, it might just be because if you were to typically have something like a blue moon or something might be garnished with an orange, maybe that might prop it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good. Uh, I would give it um, three inappropriate interns. Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I actually think this is a pretty decent white ale. Okay. Um, I love... I actually love the flavors that it does have. Okay. I personally would prefer a little bit more carbonation mm. to make it a little brighter, a little crisper. Yeah. Um, but I, I really do like the flavors this beer has. I get notes of uh, spice in here as well, almost I get some that. peppery mm -hmm. tones, which I think is great for a beer. Again, great for something that's supposed to be kind of crisp and refreshing on a summer's day. I would actually give this four Winston Churchills. Oh, that's awesome. And it might just be that... You know, I want more carbonation. I'm not really sure what it's missing. Uh, white ales aren't my favorite beer, mm. but uh, it's good. I do like it. Maybe yep. I'll bump it up to three and a half um, inappropriate interns. <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with it's that. It's so good. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you. Uh, St. Archer. St. Archer. They do not sponsor us uh, at all, but maybe they should. They should think about it. Uh -huh. All right. So moving on. Moving on. What we got on tap? <laughs> Uh, today we're discussing false equivalencies. Okay. I'm discussing a bunch of things. Sure. But I think one thing I really want to start with is the false equivalencies. Okay. In the face of the recent protests we've seen in Charlottesville, Virginia, mm. in uh, Boston recently, yep. with free speech marches, mm -hmm. and white supremacists or Nazis exercising their free speech rights, um, and, and the violence that's come around this and the violence that's come from these protests. Sure. And I've seen a lot of people on social media, whether it be Facebook, that's basically Facebook. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> YouTube. You're very go. diverse. You're a renaissance man. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. um, I've uh, seen a lot of people talking about how the Antifa protesters uh -huh. are essentially the same thing because violence is violence Cast is violence. Right. And it's not okay to be violent, and so sure. violence is violence is violence. And I think it's an interesting. We're kind of getting into a quagmire because I don't want to say that. Giggity. We, <laughs> I don't want to say that we support violence or we condone violence right. because that's. Well, my, one might say that is a slippery slope, uh -huh. but we, we'll get into that later. Sure. Uh, but the problem I have with this idea that violence is the same thing across the board is is the background of what that violence is, or the background of how it comes about. Sure. And, and what I mean here is we could, we can easily, with the Nazi theme, uh, look in history and see Nazis. They're pretty bad guys. I think we roundly condemn Nazis in I think general. so. And I've heard I, of that. I think they're so bad that we have entire series of video games, I'm talking BJ Blazkowicz, I'm talking Wolfenstein, where the entire point of the game is just to kill Nazis. Because mm. it's a lot of fun. Yep. Um, but the idea that that this this particular ideology perpetrates hate. I think it's pretty pretty fair to say we know it perpetrates hate, yes. and that if they get their way, if they get their way in power, this kind of thing happens. We know that people get murdered relentlessly all over the place because of it. Yep. The idea that that should be met with force 
the idea that those forces are equivalent, mm -hmm. I think is, I think is, I well, frankly, I think it's ludicrous um, that that a group that is attacking someone mm -hmm. can't be met with force or shouldn't be met with force. Basically, like, look, think about this: if someone breaks into your home and is trying to kill you, do you have a right to fight back? With deadly force, if possible. Mm -hmm. You do. Actually, we do. We do. But and they're just exercising free speech. <clears throat> they are exercising free speech. Mm -hmm. And and I uh, I actually don't have a problem with exercising free speech okay. so much. Um, but the idea here is that they're free speech. And they're, they're not doing it just to exercise free speech. They're doing, it correct. To, they're doing it to gain political power. Correct. And we know what happens in situations right. where groups like this gain political power and it is not peaceful it is not free speech it is this group is on the board for extermination no. yes. this group will be forcibly removed from your homes uh -huh. their viewpoints whether they are expressing them peacefully or not their viewpoints are violent you know the you know, the civil way you remove everyone of color from our country <laughs> right, right. Uh -huh. yeah no it doesn't exist yes uh, you know, I kind of liken it, and I've talked to parents about this. I've actually always had this point of view, but I, I, I liken it to bullies, right? Okay. So, obviously, if a bully touches your kid, most people say your kid can touch them back, right? That's assault. Sure. Okay. Right? Okay. But what if the bully just every day just torments your kid verbally, all right? Okay. And your kid sucks it up every day, mm -hmm. and the bully every day continues to do it. And after a year... Your kid, I don't know, punches the bully in the face. All right, so your kid mm -hmm. was violent. Yes. All right. Do we really think that they're equally responsible for what happened <laughs> in this case? I mean, the first thing I would ask my kid if they ever got in a fight is, did the person have it coming? And this is really important because the people who are it's upset with the left, we'll call them the right, Make fun of the left for being snowflakes and being wusses. They talk about the wussification of America. They actually call it something else, but I'm going to stick with wuss in this case. It rhymes with that. But yep. it, it, they're, they're talking about that, and all we're talking about is giving something to somebody that they've been asking for, right? They you mess with the bull, you get the horns, all right? Not condoning violence, but to say that this is equivalent, that they're both equally responsible for what has, has happened is a ridiculous notion. In fact, we find that when you punch the bully in the face, they stop bullying. Usually so. And that kind of leads me to where I want to talk about this. Because what we're talking about, the reason that we see uh, counter-protesting is to stop the bully before it becomes a problem. Mm. Right? That's mm -hmm. your point. So I've actually outlined, because I want to talk about this idea of false equivalency, I've outlined it in three ways. And you've highlighted at least one of those ways, obviously, for me. So let's talk about equivalent. All right. Mm -hmm. Equivalent means, for lack of a better term, equal. It's not equal. No. It means having the same value, yes. having the same impact, right? That's what equivalent is. So to your point, let's look at white supremacy. And we don't even have to go any further back than the 19th century. And yeah. so I've outlined impact, gravity, and actions. Those are the three things I'm going to talk about today. Okay. All right. So let's talk about impact, the impact of white supremacy in the world since the 19th century. All right. We've okay. had slavery in America. Mm -hmm. People died during slavery, and people were enslaved during slavery. And the reason they were enslaved is because of white supremacy. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and when I say white supremacy, I'm actually talking about our founding fathers, or the majority of them. Uh, Ryan uh, hinted on this, actually came right out and said it in our Confederate Monuments discussion. But just because you don't actively hate someone or you don't target them with violence does not mean you are not racist. Uh, being racist is the idea that you are superior to them or they are, in fact, inferior to you based on race. Mm -hmm. And our founding fathers, the majority of which, felt that way. This country was born on racism, believe it or not. And it has perpetrated everything in our country, even till today, we're still fighting against the ideas, okay? So that's number one. Number two, Nazis. More than six million people were killed just from genocide because of the Nazis. That's white supremacy. So we're talking about impact from a white supremacy standpoint. We're talking millions and millions of people. That's an impact. And not from failed government policies, keep right. in mind. We were talking about from government policies being carried out the way they were intended to. Correct. So 
Millions of people, white supremacy. Part two, Antifa. Let's look at them, or as I like to call them, the Antifa. <laughs> Let's, because uh, that's anti-fascist for those of you not in the know. And, and if you haven't been paying attention to the news in the past three weeks, you probably don't. Right. <laughs> Though you live in a hole and you're probably not watching this. <laughs> So let's look at uh, Antifa. They've been around kind of since World War II, and they are a direct result of fascism, of white supremacy. In America, they've only really been around since the, since the 1980s. So even if we take into account the World War II uh, anti-fascists and whatever's happened since the 80s, tops I can think of is maybe thousands of people might have died at the hands of anti-fascists. And those thousands are only really during the World War II, assuming they were uh, they were successful in being anti-fascist and standing right. up against Hitler, against Mussolini, against Franco mm -hmm. of Spain. Assuming that was successful, it would be thousands. Otherwise, we're talking hundreds <laughs> and low hundreds. So you got millions and hundreds. They aren't equivalent on any level from an impact perspective. If we go to gravity, gravity is organization and influence. Mm -hmm. You look at white supremacy, I already pointed out, white supremacy has been part of the American system since the founding of this country. And we have, and even our founding fathers worked against it in that they set up America to be a free place where everyone is treated equally, despite the fact that they let slavery continue on. They really recognized that at the end of the day, it's best if everyone is equal. Right. But it doesn't really matter because when you have this built into your institution and you know that the Ku Klux Klan were members of the government, probably still are members of the government, what you have is tremendous influence yes. from a white supremacy perspective. Uh, if you look again at Antifa since the 1980s, I doubt hardly anybody has been a member of the government. They are <laughs> poorly organized and they don't have the financial backing that white supremacists have. To that point, mm -hmm. you probably haven't heard of them until the past three weeks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the gravity, not there either from an equivalency perspective. So now we talk about actions. And this, uh, this is where people try to uh, conflate some things and get a little convoluted in mm -hmm. what we're talking about. So if we're talking about white supremacy, the scary thing about white supremacy is it's twofold. Uh, one, it takes no actions from any other person to really make you a white supremacist. You just have to decide you're better than somebody else <laughs> or that they're inferior to you. And part two, and this is the scariest part, is once you've decided that, that is super empowering. That is empowering to know that you are better than someone else mm -hmm. and that they are inferior to you. And what you get are people that are willing to do a lot of things other people aren't willing to do because they think they have the right to it. They deserve it. So that's the actions they take. And we see these actions because first we saw slavery, then we saw Nazis, then we see neo-Nazis, and we've also seen what are called lynchings during Jim Crow era. People of white supremacy have never demonstrated an inability to not commit violence. <laughs> It is more a hallmark. Yeah, or sorry, an inability to commit violence. They're happy to do that. Yeah. Right? So now let's look at Antifa and their actions. The interesting thing about them is they only exist in direct response to white supremacy. Yeah, if Nazis, if white supremacy doesn't exist, if fascism isn't there being a scourge upon the land, mm -hmm. there's no Antifa. There's no Antifa. In America today, it started in the 80s in Minneapolis to fight neo-Nazis. And frankly, you know what happened? They beat the neo-Nazis. We haven't heard about them since the 80s, frankly, maybe the 90s. And largely, their methods work. <clears throat> largely, I do not condone their methods. But the reason they use the methods is because they do work. <clears throat> uh, what is it? I think it Reagan said, carry a big stick. I don't think it was Reagan. Might have come before him. Eh, maybe. Well, might have been a Roosevelt. I don't know. Who knows? No <laughs> one does. There's no way, and, there's, and there's no way to find out either. Mm -hmm. But the whole point, the whole point is that uh, one of the things that we try to do with military strength in this country, in yeah. the United States, is to have a giant arsenal to scare the shit out of people so they don't start things. That was a Reagan policy, by the way. It was. <laughs> it was a Reagan policy. And so, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. I think yes, that, was the that is correct. There yeah. we go. Yep. <laughs> All right. So the, the idea that we shouldn't be intimidating to make people not do horrible things is actually entirely contradictory to U.S. foreign policy, FYI. <laughs> That's really good. Thanks. I like that. So 
they are effective, but they only exist because of white supremacy. Now, there's this talk about an anarcho-communism, mm. which, by the way, I looked up. It is a thing. It just rolls off the tongue. It does. Anarcho-communism. <laughs> right? And the thing about Antifa is they're so poorly organized that I'm not even sure that all of them feel that way. And they usually disappear when white supremacy disappears. I can't tell you the last Antifa uh, march that they just put together. Um, in general, sometimes they uh, protest the World Trade Organization. That happens. I don't hear about a bunch of cops usually being spat upon and attacked or random attacks from that. <laughs> by Antifa. Yeah, by right. Antifa. See, that's not a thing. They don't just do stuff. They do stuff in response to white supremacy. That is not equivalent. Now, some people would argue that Antifa attacks cops. I would argue that people on both sides, in general, have people that attack cops. Hmm? All right? That's just something that happens, and it's wrong, and it shouldn't happen, and I don't support it. But I don't know of any mainstream cause that actually tells its people to attack cops. And you know this because you don't actually see a lot of cops killed and attacked. Right, again, when Antifa isn't battling white supremacists, they aren't attacking cops. Right. Right? And white supremacists generally aren't attacking cops either. <laughs> Unless but, they're black. Yeah. <laughs> and, but we do know that some top cops are attacked from both sides. Sure. And, and that's wrong. But to say just because you happen to know Antifa attacks cops and to say that's equivalent, I just walked you through. There is no equivalency there. That is wrong. It is a lie. Antifa is, they're not good. <laughs> Let's get that straight. They don't represent good. And the mm. reason I say this is because they are the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And that is a scary thing to have from just an individual or even a, a small group or even a large group of individuals. I am the law. Right. <laughs> He's the law. And I wouldn't trust him if he were the law. That is the problem. They are concerned. They are something we should be very concerned with. But by saying they are equivalent, especially if you're a fascist, especially, especially if you're a fascist, but to say they are equivalent to white supremacy is indeed to sanitize the impact that white supremacy has had throughout the world and in America today because the impact, the gravity, and the actions between the two are not comparable. It's such a massive divide. It is. It really is. We should watch them. We should be ready. We should not condone their violence. But let's not call call them equal. Yeah. That's nutty. I think, I think it's about one of the furthest things from the truth you could possibly say. Absolutely. All right. So next, slippery slopes. What you got? Slippery slopes. People talk about uh, the freedom of speech, for instance, with these marches, especially this recent march in Boston where the alt-right, the Nazis, the skinheads, whoever put together this rally for walking or a march for free speech yeah so they're like yeah i have a i have a legal right to be as disgusting as i want to be which is true currently and, <laughs> currently mm -hmm. and uh, it was broken up by a lot of counter protesters but i've heard a lot of people say that this really is a freedom of speech issue and i think it's interesting when when you hear people say it's freedom of speech and when you don't hear People, people, I think, pick and choose when free speech needs to be free speech and when it should be disgusting. Sure. I just want to get that out there. Free speech, well, we, we like to make it suit our own needs. But, uh, but the idea that free speech and limiting free speech is a slippery slope, I don't think is really a great argument. And the, the reason being is almost nothing is actually a slippery slope. Okay. Now, there, there are, I, I think it, at best, it's a, it's a gentle terrace. You can, uh, you can walk down it very purposefully mm -hmm. if you so choose, but it's not like you're just going to fall and keep rolling and keep rolling and keep yeah. rolling. Um, and, and case in point is, we're going to go back to the Nazis. We're going to go back to Germany and Nazi Germany. At the end of the war, um, Germany was punished by economic... I mean, their economy was crippled. Uh, they weren't allowed to have an army. Yeah. They, they're, they, were, they, they paid a massive price for what happened in World War II. Germany has outlawed a lot of Nazi stuff. Okay. There is no such thing as a Nazi political party in Germany. It is illegal. There are lots of things about what you can say and what you can't say about Nazism to their detriment. Right. It's not like other rights have been infringed. Hmm. 
and it's not as though the country per se is worse off as a result. So they stopped there. They stopped hmm. there. They didn't oh. slide down that slippery slope. It's almost as though it was a gentle terrace, huh? And not a slippery uh -huh. slope. And so I think, and, and now that that doesn't mean I want to be clear. That doesn't mean that in the United States I support curbing this speech, right. but understanding what it is and understanding that the idea of a slippery slope is an inaccurate representation of the argument, mm -hmm. I think is important to do. Yeah. Like I say, it's not a slippery slope. I say it's a purposeful defiant march off a cliff, right? Yeah. It, slippery slope means that it accidentally happened. You lost your footing and it was unintentional and you had no idea this was going to happen. And the next thing is, of, I mean, of course it is. You're falling. Of course this is the next thing that's going to happen. Right. No, we know we can logically discuss and conclude some of the things that could happen, and we could actually keep them from happening if we so chose to do so, but we typically don't, and then we call it a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Or we pretend like it's a slippery slope and we don't even make the initial change. <laughs> or, or that the change that came after it, we had nothing to do with. Right, absolutely. Oh so, my gosh, it just happened. <laughs> what else could be expected? Yeah, we, we know better. We, we purposefully do ridiculously stupid things or don't do the initial reasonable step because we think we're going to do ridiculously stupid things which we probably would but so sure. i'm going to talk about three slippery slopes that aren't really that slippery Ooh, love it all right so number one prayer in school uh-huh all right so when i was younger i remember i was talking to family members and they didn't want moments of silence okay in schools and their argument was that a moment of silence is really just the first step towards that slippery slope of prayer in school. Okay. Because why do we have moments of silence? I would say so people can pray. Yeah. Or at the very least, reflect internally without any, without any outward indication. Yeah. But we do assume a lot of them would pray during that moment of silence. Assuming you're a majority religious nation. Yes. One would. Yes. So the, the argument here is, well, we don't do moments of silence because then people say, well, look, you gave us the moment of silence so we can pray, so why don't we just make it prayer in school? Well, because from that slippery slope, we can say, because it's not legal to have prayer in school. Because the two things are inherently and intrinsically different. That is correct. So no, you can allow moments of silence, that makes sense, and then say no to prayer in school. Mm -hmm. We're not just going, we're not just walking off that cliff. There's no reason to. There's a separation of church and state. We can all have that discussion and not do it. It would need to be an incredibly deliberate move it for something really like would. that to happen, even if moments in silence are allowed. Yep. Number two. Uh, recently, we were able to... Did you make a mess? I spilled a little this bit. This guy makes a mess. Gross. Uh, we were able to genetically modify an embryo. Ooh. All right. So, sounds good. Most of us would say, why did we do it? And it was to cure... Uh, a disability or a disease. Um, uh, so if I said we could do that before your child is born, most of us would say, that sounds good. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Oh. Like if I knew my kid was going to be born with a, a, a defect yeah. and that could be stopped, what, why wouldn't you want that? That sounds reasonable. Uh -huh. Now there's some stuff we could talk about prior to that research, but that sounds reasonable enough. Sure. But the slippery slope is designer babies. Uh-huh. Okay. Is that really something that's slippery? I mean, I, I think you probably have to purposefully choose to have designer babies. <laughs> yeah, yes. Like, we, we wouldn't know, oh, wow, my gosh, I don't know how we got to designer babies. Like, yeah, you do. Like, oh, I, I cured this particular disease, and then it just so happened that the baby had blue eyes, blonde hair, and was six foot two mm -hmm. and muscular and incredibly intelligent. Ah, oh, such a slippery slope. <laughs> it's not a, sipper, a slippery slope. We do it on purpose. <laughs> and that brings me to number three. And we're going back to the Confederacy Ooh. and the Confederate statues. Let's. So we are, oh, I'm gonna do some build up before I get to this slippery slope, but Good. we're confusing the people with the statues. Yes, so I call this a mixed bag because I'm tying up a couple of things here. All right, so we say Robert E. Lee was a good guy. Why can't we have a statue? You can. Mm -hmm. He probably was, for that time period, a good guy. Mm -hmm. He probably had a lot of insight and noble statements and noble thoughts and noble causes and all these other respectable things. Mm -hmm. No problem. That Confederate statue is not meant to honor any of those things. It's meant to honor the Confederacy, which are none of those things. It's a statue for a purpose other than Robert E. Lee. It's of Robert E. Lee, but it's celebrating all these other bad things that we shouldn't be celebrating. The slippery slope here 
is that people are like, well, if you're going to take down Robert E. Lee, why not take down George Washington? Because again, we're separating the statue from the person. The George mm -hmm. Washington statue does not celebrate George Washington as a slave owner. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, Thomas Jefferson doesn't celebrate him as a slave owner. Abraham Lincoln, who someone decided to vandalize, we're not celebrating Abraham Lincoln and his thoughts on whether or not black people were as good as white people. We're celebrating the fact that he had, for whatever reason, the foresight to emancipate the slaves. That's what we're celebrating here. Mm -hmm. So if you think that the, stat like the Robert E. Lee statue is is there, uh, should be torn down because he thought blacks were inferior or because he owned slaves, you're wrong. We want it torn down because it represents the attitudes that all of those things are okay. That's why it needs to go. These aren't slippery slopes. I can have a normal conversation with you about George Washington and you can say, well, George Washington owned slaves. And I'd say, yeah, that's bullshit. That, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you'd say. Yeah, that is what I'd say. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. And he banged them. It was bullshit. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And then you say, but that statue has nothing to do with that. Right. Like, wait, did he not pen the declaration? <laughs> oh, oh, he did. Oh, yeah. See, that's what we should honor? Oh, uh, okay. yeah. Oh, wait, was that important and is that meaningful? Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. I mean, if, if our idea is to get rid of anything that's repugnant before 2017, we're getting rid of a lot of stuff. Basically everything. Like our history. Yeah. Like we don't deserve to have history. We don't deserve to acknowledge people for doing the great things they did do. In a time where if you're white and you had money, mm. you were owning slaves. You're not better than they are. You aren't. And if you're black, <clears throat> I get it. I don't really know what to tell you, except we're trying to celebrate the things that do make this country great. Not to get rid of those just because it's a person who lived in a time where bad decision making was also part of the course of history. Yep. And <clears throat> I want to go into it a little bit on the, the same thing with the statues. Uh, <clears throat> Because obviously that's been a lot at the center of a lot of this controversy mm -hmm. recently, um, and I've heard people say, if you know we're tearing down statues, we're tearing down history, we're doomed to repeat it. If we tear down these statues, why don't we tear down Auschwitz? Look, Auschwitz is still up; it serves as a reminder to history. Mm -hmm. And my argument is that the statues actually don't serve as a reminder to history. No, the um, Auschwitz is up to remind us of the level of depravity and evil that men can can force upon other men. And it is left there as a reminder of the historic atrocities yep. and evil that stained the face of the human race. General Lee statues, you literally put on a pedestal. Yeah. <laughs> they are not the same thing. You look at the Robert E. Lee statues as something that is proud and something that is noble. That is not erasing the Civil War. It's not erasing the no. animosity. It is whitewashing the atrocities that yeah. we committed here on this soil by putting those men on pedestals and saying, everything's fine. They were just complex. Yep. It, you, you don't look at it as a, as a cautionary tale. You don't look at it as a stain. You look at it as proud, and you're wrong. Yep. And, you know, it's interesting. So for everyone who's like, yeah, tear down all of them. Hold your horses here. <laughs> All right, um, I, I've been talking to several people. So we're talking about this from an academic perspective, really. Sure. Um, in that, I'm not saying tear them all down. I'm just saying I can't come up with a good reason to keep them up, frankly. What I really think should happen here is, A, there needs to be logical, reasonable discussion about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we found that in most cases where they were taken down, there indeed was logical and reasonable discussion where you had a city council or somebody else get together, discuss it, and say, you know what? These these are a black mark on our city. We don't want them. And that's, and I'm all for that. I'm all for local governments and organizations getting together, having the discussion, saying as a community, mm -hmm. we don't want this. Because here's a fun little thing I was thinking about here. If your community says, I do want it, that helps us remember the past. What that tells us is you're probably a racist community. <laughs> And that should be a marker for everyone. Like, that is the goal, right? We don't want to forget the past. Okay, so I'm cruising through somewhere in the South, and I see this great Stonewall Jackson Memorial, and I thought, 
I thought everybody discussed this and they decided to take it down. No, they decided to keep it. You might want to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> you might not want to stop there. <laughs> I mean, maybe you like it, I don't know, but that is indeed a marker because if you knew everyone discussed it and some people kept it up, that really does tell you about how they view history. And then when you look at those statues, you can take your son or daughter and they say, hey, why is that statue there? Because this town is super racist. <laughs> we learned. <laughs> Thanks, history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was going to say something, but I can't even remember because that was hilarious. <laughs> well, on that last call. Oh, I, oh, you know what? Yes. Yeah. Um, and the idea that that um, th this stuff being decided on a local level, that is great because that is the epitome and it, it's, it's the best part about small government, about yep. local government, deciding how you want your community to be run. Sounds very right wing. It does. It sounds huh. incredibly right wing. Uh -huh. And so I think, I, think that is, I think that's the way it should be done. Yep. And, and keep in mind, I'm only talking about private, or I'm sorry, public lands. Yep. If, it's a pri if it's private land, there's... There's no reason. There's no. There, there shouldn't be discussion. Yeah, that's private land. That's a. It's none of your thing. business. Is it's, what that yeah, is. Yeah, it's none of your business. And if it's, uh, it's this is only if this is on public land. Uh, and again, we we'd said before, if this were West Point, it'd be a different story. It if be. it were a battlefield, it'd be a different mm -hmm. story. Oh, I like to say I'll take um, Mexican War, Robert E. Lee. I'll take U.S. military, Robert E. Lee. Yeah. I'll take uh, Saint Peter, uh, Saint Paul's Church, Robert E. Lee. Uh, but I won't take Confederate soldier Robert E. Lee as much as I wouldn't take uh, Massa uh, Jefferson or Massa Washington as right. a statue. Right. There's ways to do this, and they're all reasonable, and they can all be discussed, and we can all not slide down that slippery slope together. Yep. So let's, uh, let's maybe cheers and, and sit upon a uh, comfortable terrace. That sounds good. Cheers. Cheers. Till next time, remember, it's just beer and politics. Check us out on all that stuff. Say hi to Madam Brewmaster. She actually sits beside the camera all the time. She's waving. You can't tell, but she's there. <laughs>